And I said, wow, that's awesome. And he says, yeah, I feel like I was born again. And he looked at me, and he says, not that born again. <laughs> not Ted. But anyway, as I said, Ted always mentions the acts and facts that we have in the volumes in the back. Please, please pick them up. It's a great way to reach your friends and family. And, uh, and, and actually, it's a great place to Christmas shop for grandkids. I enjoy looking through it and finding things. Anyway, will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity we have here at Tahoe Community Church among the believers and our friends and family, Lord God, just to uh, get into your word, the avenues we have to learn, Lord God, through. Uh, we just ask that your blessing uh, continue on our worship service, Lord. And thank you for this time we have together. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>
Guys, uh, I thought that Bob was going to say a few words. That was Bob in the bear outfit. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, yeah. and he is, he is yeah. more athletic than I ever was. <laughs> ever. Ever. When I was 19, he was way more athletic than me. Um, I, I, uh, I've been, to, of course, to the Great Fall of the Lake thing. And uh, I also have to say, Kevin can give a really touching mini sermon. That man got some people, including me. I was tearing up. He knows what he's doing. If you want to rise up, um, we'll uh, do some singing together for Jesus. This song is called I Will Rise. One, two, three, four.
funny that um, we had this thing with Allie because uh, this is a song that she wanted to put into the rotation and uh, I wanted to do this one because she did. Oh 
and they can use more people just even to help with the equipment. Am I right? It's four o'clock on Saturday. Yep. And stay at four o'clock for, for now. Yep. Okay. So they can always use if you like to be there about an hour and a half before then, as far as any assistance. One thirty, if you want to help. One thirty, and it's fun. You, 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 God has a plan and everything, and you're going to have an opportunity <laughs> to talk to people because they're going to come and ask you what you're doing. And then I'm reminded of BBS. What an outreach that's been. To reach uh, children in our community, we not only reach the children, but we reach the parents. It's an opportunity. And there again, we can use hands, joyful hands, and to, to be there and to assist with reaching our community. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity and worship. We can joyfully give of our time, our talent, and our funds, Lord God, to support your word. Not only this this. It's not about this building, but it's about moving Christ forward, the plan that you have in each and every one of our lives, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity. Uh, please uh, bless this time in our worship service. In your name we pray. Amen. We're going to have the kids in the back. If there's any kids here today? If you have the Bibles, turn with me to the book of John, chapter 17. And certainly if you are new here this morning, we welcome you. We have been going through the book of Colossians. And we have been uh, really looking at what Paul has been telling us about the sufficiency of Jesus and the way in which our culture of the world uh, wants to interrupt that or wants to challenge it or wants to dismiss it, however word you want to use. And uh, hopefully you have a green sheet. Because we're going to be seeing some things today, and uh, here's a question for you. When we think about, uh, there's a phrase that, that appears often in just kind of the cliche world, and that is, uh, when God was bringing Israel out of Egypt, he had just got done finishing the ten plagues, uh, the Pharaoh's uh, firstborn son, amongst all of the other firstborn son of, of the Egyptians, was killed by the angel of death. And uh, Pharaoh finally said, I've had enough. Go, leave. How long did it take for Israel to be led out of Egypt? How many hours? We're just guessing here. We're just spitballing here. 48 hours. It's good. Two hours? A couple million people? <laughs> There's a phrase that often appears that it took uh, God 40 hours to take Israel out of Egypt, but 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. And it's a good phrase because what do we know? When we think about uh, Israel, uh, the 12 tribes, however you want to phrase it, wandering around for, for 40 years, or even in the beginning when, when God was upset with them, what were some of the things that they that they remembered about Egypt? The food. The food. Yes. Man, Moses, what did you bring us out here for? And we have this manna. Man, I remember. I don't think they said onions or tomatoes. <laughs> so. I don't think that's in the Bible. But they remembered the vegetables. They remembered all the fruits. They remembered all the luxuries they had. But what did they forget? Slavery? The slavery. It's interesting here that when, when we think about the Christian life, and here we are singing about storms and other challenges, oftentimes we get stuck into remembering the good part of our old life, if you want to say it that way, and forgetting some of the challenges and the bondage and the other things that were there. And what Paul is, is sharing with the Colossians is he reminds them to move forward in their experience with God and in their understanding of the gospel. And, and he says, you know, keep your thoughts on things above, in the heavens, and we'll see that, but not on things on earth. And so what, what I want to see here is we're going to see this idea of the world, these earthly things, these worldly things. And on the top of your sheet there, when we think about the world, um, I just put on here uh, not so much waterfalls and, and mountains and beaches. We're not talking about the created world. The, the word cosmos in Greek is very well known to, to mean like the system, the realm of existence that is earthly. 
It's temporal. It's in opposition and hostile to God in thought, deed, focus, sin, and depravity. It's this idea of 1 John 5, 19 says the whole world lies under the power or the sway of the wicked one. And, and we have um, the idea of the world appears several hundred times in the New Testament. But in John 17, I want us to see something here. Because it appears 18 times in this short chapter. And when you think about uh, our old life, uh, in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, it describes us as being in bondage to the world, in bondage to the prince of the power of the air, in bondage to the flesh. And, we, and he says, this, this was your old life. When you thought like the world thinks, when you thought uh, in the way that is hostile to God, and when we look out at our culture, it's becoming more and more obvious, and we talk about this over and over now, it's becoming uh, really so much easier to see what does the world think about A, B, C, or D? And you go, well, how do you know? Because when you ask ourselves, think about it this way. Where do you, where do you get your beliefs from? And oftentimes, when we think about, we throw out a topic, Again, it could be, what do you think about uh, politics? What do you think about economics? What do you think about um, you know, social systems? What do you think about poor, being rich? What do you think about businesses? What do you think about morality? When, when, we, when we throw all those topics out there, they, oftentimes we look at those and we say, these are worldviews. What do you think about A? And list it down. And... You know, I wasn't raised a Christian, so, you know, I, I was confronted with the gospel in college. But I remember being thoroughly worldly. And what does that mean? I thought it was the world did. Well, where do you get your view? Well, uh, I, I guess I'll ask you guys. Where does the world get their viewpoints from? CNN. Social media? <laughs> mainstream media? Social media, right? The devil. Certainly the devil. I mean, they're, they're not necessarily having a conference with the devil, but we know, according, according to 1 John 5, 19, that the whole world, the whole system, lies under his influence. We get it through books. You know, when we look at the world, and we, we're looking at the world out there, regardless all the way around the world, do you turn on, you know, mainstream media, or do you turn on uh, social media, or whatever that looks like? However, the things that come in radio, internet, television, all these things, do they say, well, we're going to assess um, social customs today, and in the Bible it says <laughs> they have no room for God's word. They don't care about this book. What is this book to them? What 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 is what is Jesus' words to them? It's, it's irrelevant. It's interesting, just recently there was a, I saw this in, I was watching it on, on, on C-SPAN, and they were talking about, um, I think they were talking about abortion or something, in Congress. And some, somebody got up and was reading some texts from Scripture, and one of the other guys said, so-and-so, Senator, so-and-so, we just want you to know that when you read from that book, it has nothing to do with what we're doing here in Congress. And I was like, ooh. I kind of put my head down and I was like, you have very clearly, take that book and get rid of it. Because we don't have, it has nothing to do with our uh, uh, making or creating of laws. God is not welcome here. And that's what you see in the system all around. And so, when, when we ask ourselves, and we, we think about the world, the first question, and, and as you talk with people, friends, family, etc., and you go, you know, what do you, I, I used to get this all the time, Mongo, what do you think about this? And I go, well, who cares what I think? I mean, really, I'm not asking you to believe what I believe. Because Mondo's opinion is irrelevant. But I will say this, I'm a Christian, so I, I'll tell you what Jesus says. I'll tell you what God has says. I'll tell you what the scripture says. And so if you want to know what I believe, I'm doing my best <laughs> as, as all Christians to, to make my views match what God says. 
And as long as we interpret Scripture correctly and accurately and, and we're, we're very uh, attuned, that we're not misrepresenting, that's what matters because ultimately, you know, we have seven people in here, but what do you think about this? You all write it down, and ultimately we have 70 opinions. And honestly, I really don't care about your opinion, and you shouldn't care about mine. But if you want to say, the Bible says, I'd say, okay, I'm interested. Because I want to match. I want to set my mind on heavenly things, not on earthly opinions. And in John 17, I want you to see Jesus' opinion, or if you want to say it that way, Jesus' belief about the world. Now, the world appears many, many times in the Gospel of John. And we know that God so loved the world. He does love the world. He loves, and, and the, the word is used in a variety of, of ways. It's used of the mountains. It's used of the people. But it's also used of the system. So when we know that God loves the world, he loves people, no doubt. But in this passage, Jesus is speaking about the system. And he says in John 17, he's just, I just want to read this and see how many times you can pull out the word world here. He says in verse 4, I have glorified you, he's talking to the Father, this is the night before he's betrayed. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. He's talking about the physical world. Before the physical world was created, Jesus is the creator. Jesus is saying, I want to go back to that glory that you and I had together before the, the physical world even existed. He says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you have given out of the world. Okay. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me, and they have received them. And have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. So Jesus is praying to the Father. He says, I have, I have all these people, Lord, Father in heaven. You've given me these people who believe. I've given them your message, and they have accepted it. And they not only that, but they know that you sent me, Jesus, into this world to reach them. Look at verse 9. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. Now, is that not shocking? Jesus, I don't pray for the world. The world and its system is unredeemable. I pray for these people, these believers. I do not pray for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now, I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. We still live here. Jesus left this place to go to heaven for a period of time before he returns. He says, and I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you've given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, but the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. <coughs> when we go and we share Jesus' message, and again, I, it, I, I, I think it's fun, maybe it's a, a little mischievous, just throwing out a passage of scripture on social media. And you will get blasted. You will be shamed. You will be sought to be canceled. You will be sought to be minimized. <coughs> you will have labels thrown at you. And Jesus says, people will hate you. Simply because you share his word, his message. The world has hated them because they are not of this world just as I am not. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. I wish Jesus would have prayed that. Because sure, wouldn't it be nice to get saved and go straight to heaven? 
But then who would be left to be a light and to share the gospel? He says, don't take them out of the world, but keep them, protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Here again, Jesus is saying the second time, my people, those who claim to follow me, those who are true to me, those who are genuine to me, will be alienated and ostracized from the way that the world thinks. This is where you look at in Luke chapter 6 where Jesus says, if everybody speaks well of you, watch out. Woe unto you when everybody speaks well of you. Because what, what, how would everybody speak well of you? What's missing often? Truth. Truth. Because Jesus made the comment about light and truth, and he says, the reason that people don't like my message is because I speak truth. And people don't like the light because light exposes wickedness. And people don't like that. And so when you speak truth, you get, you get labeled. And of course, um, Jesus was killed because he spoke truth. And so you have this, this distinction. He says, sanctify them by your truth. So what is true? That's something the pilot asked. Well, we don't need to guess. Jesus says, your word is true. So as we go out and we share the truth, what are we sharing? The book. Well, that book's old. That book's out of date. That book's out of fashion. It's anachronistic. Seriously? Why do we even care what that book says? Well, because it's God's eternal word. And God's word doesn't go out of date. Uh, what he says, Jesus says, my words will never pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall never pass away. We know from 2 Timothy 3, 15, that this book is able to make you wise for salvation. If you want to know how to have eternal life, this is where you find it. It's not a little bit over there, and a little bit from that book, a little bit from that religion, a little bit here. Why? Because Jesus said, I am the only way. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they may also be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you, have, you gave me, I have given them. That they may be one just as we are. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. I love that. I have that like double underline here. Jesus says, God loves you just as much as he loves Jesus. If you are a follower of him and you get in, you, you get welcomed in on the inside and you're part of the family. Now, I think my, probably one of my favorite passages in all, certainly in the Gospel of John, is verse 24. Father, you see Jesus is our here. Father, I desire that they also, who you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. You know what Jesus wants? Father, I'm going, I'm going to you. I'm going to leave her, and I'm going up there for a little period of time before he returns. You know what I want? I want all the people that you've given to me that have followed me, that have believed in me, even though they haven't seen me, that have left their old life, that have chosen to repent of their sins and put their faith and trust and their, their reliance on their eternal destiny in Jesus Christ. He says, you know what I want? I want them to be with me. And you know what else I want? I want them to see me. Glorified. I don't want them just to see me in this earthly human existence that I'm coming down here as a servant. I want them to see me in the fullness of who I am as the glorious, majestic creator and savior of all. The one who has been exalted above the highest heavens, who is seated at the right hand of God. As we say, Philippians 2.10, whom every knee will bow. 
want them to see that, Lord. And he had said earlier, you know why? Because we're his friends. He says, I no longer call you slaves. You're my friends. And the Father has given you to me as a gift. And I, I'm not going to reject my Father's gift to me. He says, and help them to be with me, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you. Think about that. Is Jesus correct that the world does not know the Father? So when you look out there and, and, you, and you're making, let's say you're making a decision, well, what do I want to believe? I, I want to be spiritual but not religious. What do I want to believe? Hmm. Where are you going to get your facts from? Follow your heart. Now, we know from Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart is deceitful. Now, I want to clarify something on that, because I, that was brought up last week to me. Jeremiah 79 is talking about the state of humanity, that the heart is deceitful above all things, incurably wicked. Who can trust it? Who can know it? Now, if you took an unbeliever, are they the most wicked person that you ever met in your entire life? Is every, is every unbeliever Hitler? No. But the heart of man, can an unbeliever do something nice? Of course they can. Jeremiah isn't saying that every person is as worse as possible. Every person is a Hitler. I, I don't even think even Hitler killed his mom, his own parents. So when you look at this regard, you look and you go, what he's saying there is your heart will deceive you. It'll lead you into places that you might not want to go. It'll tell you, this is okay, this is out of love, or whatever, and you end up getting into deception, or you get into uh, complete law-breaking. All it's saying there is that the heart is not Scripture. Heart and emotions. Has anybody ever been led into sin through emotion? Yes. <laughs> could be anger, could be, you name it. And it's interesting, if we did, let's do a little calculation. I, I like feedback. Of all the sins that you have committed, what percentage of them was done through emotion versus intellectual decision? 90? Anybody going higher? Yeah. I remember we're all different. Maybe you're cerebral. But what that tells you that if your emotions have led you into 80 plus percent sin, the heart is deceitful. And will lead you into things that are contrary to Scripture. That's what the Scripture is saying. Is emotions, the heart, will lead you down the wrong path. We should always say, hmm, my heart or my emotions are telling me this. But what does Scripture say? What does truth say? So as we, as we move in here, I want to show you on your sheet there. As the, this text is going to be pretty short and straightforward. The title is Living the Heavenly Life in Our Worldly Realm. We are bombarded constantly with thoughts and beliefs and arguments and philosophies. And we've already saw it in Colossians chapter 2. Don't let anybody cheat you through empty philosophy. Beware, lest you come in and to worship spirits and other beings. Again, when you think about what are you going to base your eternal life on, are you going to have a buffet religion? Well, I like a little bit of Islam. I like a little bit of the Eastern stuff. I like a little bit of this. And you start going, where are you getting this stuff from? How did you develop your philosophy or your theology of life? Because what you think, what you believe is going to determine your actions, correct? We see that. And before we choose to live and, and act out in a certain way, we need to make sure... That our, act, that our thinking is accurate. That's why two things. To live the heavenly life, we must adjust our thinking, and that leads to adjusting our actions. That's what Paul's after here. The question for us is, again, if somebody comes to you, what do you think about A, B, C, or D? You're going to go, well, let me find a verse on that. 
Because in Matthew 4.4, 4, we, we see the consistency here. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds out of God's mouth. And we know, well, what's, what does that mean? Well, all scripture is God-breathed. 2 Timothy 3.16. So we have this, this truth. Now, I remember being 19 years old. Uh, really, uh, atheist, believing, how did I live my life? I lived my life the way I wanted. <laughs> the world told me it was okay. I wasn't a murderer. You know, Mondo, are you? I remember being confronted with the gospel, and it's like, well, you're going to hell. What am I going to hell for? I'm not that bad. And we all come to this thing that we, when, when we stand before God and God says, why should I let you to heaven? We go, well, <laughs> I'm not as bad as John is. We immediately look at our life, and we the standard is we find the worst possible God. I'm not a Hitler. And we, go, and we start saying, we start whipping out our resume. Well, I'm not that bad. On whose standard? Because the world tells me, if I help the person cross the street, I'm not that bad. As long as I'm not a Hitler, as long as I'm not this, as long as I'm not this, 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 then the world says you're okay. Hey, follow your heart. Let your emotions guide you. And we know that, look at some of these words here. You are from beneath, Jesus is speaking to the crowd. I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. John 3.3, 3, I put there on your sheet. Jesus said, unless you are born from above, you will not even see the kingdom of heaven. The world cannot hate you, John 7, 7, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. Man, Jesus just draws the line here. Now, what is Jesus' heart? I have come not to condemn the world, but that the world through the Son would be saved. So we don't want to put Jesus as just, you know, some some uh, doom and gloomer, but he also comes to say, hey guys, I have come, I loved you, I voluntarily give my life, but you need to put your faith and trust in me, and you need to follow me. The world isn't going to follow me. In fact, the world hates me so much so that it's going to kill me here soon. Because why? I testify that its works are evil. Its system, its beliefs, it's, 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 it's hostile to the scripture. 1 John 2.15, if you go down there, he says this. Do not love the world, system, or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Is that not black and white? Well, yeah, but what if I just get a little bit of my belief from social media? What if I get a little bit of my belief from the way the world thinks? Jesus is making this... Hard and fast, and we see First John in the same thing. Do not connect yourself with the world. The world is passing away. If you love the world, God is not in you. That's serious. He says, and I came there Romans 12, 2, where he says, um, do not be conformed to what? To this world. But be transformed by the renewing renew of your mind. Where do you get your viewpoints from? Scripture. Don't let the world conform you. That's what it wants. One of my favorite words is nonconformist. From Romans 12, 2. Man, say that proud. We look at Scripture and we look and we say, what does God think about that? I can tell you. What, what, what the Bible says is what I'm going to embrace. He says in James 4, 4, adulterers and adulteresses, he's speaking spiritually here. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I think, I know for me, I was very worldly. I, I mean, what do you think about, where did we come from? Well, evolution. It was billions of years, you know, I got to... Uh, I guess I came from a monkey a long time ago, and you know, and blah blah blah. Why do you believe that? 
Well, that's what I was taught. I was educated. You know, it took biology and evolution in college, even before a Christian, and, and geology, and learning about all these things, and, you, and astronomy, and you go, okay, well, what do you, what do you believe? Well, I believe this. Why? Well, because that's what I was taught. And then you get confronted with scripture, and there is no um, compromise. God created the world, and he created man. End of story. And then, of course, if you really get into the science, you see that it doesn't back up, you know, uh, macroevolutionary uh, empirical science. But nevertheless, you go, man, I've got to start unlearning some of these things. It's hard for me, but I've been ingrained in this, and, and depending on when you became a believer, but there's a contrast between your old life and your new life. That's what we're going to see here, is Paul has been preaching the gospel. He says, okay, guys, I want you to remember your old life, where you have come from. But is there a moment when you made a choice I'm going to follow Jesus now. And now I need to, to think about all this worldly thinking, and I need to begin to unlearn it. Not to be conformed, but to have my mind renewed, to be transformed. And that takes a long time. And there's a lot of different categories of how we do that. So Colossians 3, he says this. Since then, chapter 3, verse 1, since then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. I appreciate Paul saying this. Christianity is a thinking man's religion. We don't just walk in here and go, well, I'll check my brain at the door. I'm coming in here and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing all these songs and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have this existential, experiential, emotional experience. But I'm not going to think. And don't argue with me because I, I had an emotional experience. So when we walk out, we go, well, you can't challenge me. Are you telling me that, what's the phrase? Are you telling me my feelings are wrong? <laughs> what do you think about that? If that's the standard, can a Muslim have a religious experience? Can a Mormon? Can a Hindu? Can a spiritual not religious? Can, as we talked about last week, we talked about psychedelics and all these other things. Can these people have spiritual experiences? Absolutely. We're not denying those. Can you go to, I saw it yesterday, can you go to the local psychic and have a legitimate, possibly, real experience where they reach to the other side in the spiritual realm and give you a, an insight or something that you're like, how did you know that? I have no problem with that. If divining or psychicking to the other side wasn't real, God wouldn't have forbidden it in the Old Testament under the penalty of death. The reason that he said don't do it is because you're getting access to the spiritual realm which is out to deceive, to destroy, to kill, and hurt you. If there was no risk there, God would say, well, I'm not going to have you kill people unnecessarily because it's not possible. But because it is possible, and... The good spirits will never violate God. Anytime you go and you reach to the other side and you have this spiritual experience, it is meant 100% for deception. And that's why it's so serious. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. What? When we, I'll give you an example. There's a sense that Paul is he's talking figurative and spiritually here. When you are born from above, or born again, it depends on the translation, but I think it's born from above. It doesn't matter. There's a, there's a time in your life, and it doesn't matter whether you know the exact date, it's irrelevant. The question is, as of right now, of today, here we are at 1135, have you made the choice? to follow Jesus and commit your entire life to him and have decided, I've been walking this way, I'm going to turn away from my old life, and man, 
I'm going to follow God, and I know that's going to be hard and difficult, and it's going to cause me a lot of challenge in my thinking, but then I want to follow him, and I want to renew my mind. Have you done that? And if you have, then what Paul is saying is you died over there. That old person, like baptism, we have the image of sprinkling doesn't really portray the image. Man, we're going to, some people, we hold them down for a little longer, right? <laughs> they had a previous life, and we're going to make sure the image fits. Browning out that old life and bring it back up. <laughs> Paul is saying that old life is dead. What worthy of this new life that you claim to have? No one does it perfectly. That's what you're saying. But all scripture is inspired and is profitable for what? Doctrine, teaching, for correction, for reproof. Okay? It's correcting my life, it's correcting my thinking, it's putting me back on the straight road. Man, I've been going down that road. It's it, it's it, it is profitable to make the person who follows um, complete, thoroughly equipped. For every good work. The scripture, that's why Jesus said in John 17, 17. Sanctify them by your truth. For your word is truth. What does sanctify mean? <laughs> it's like a cleansing to separate. So we go and we go, man, I used to think this. But man, scripture just slapped me upside the head. And now I'm, I'm, I need to change my thinking. And now I'm going to go this way. I'm not going to be conformed to that old way. And so when we come along sometimes, we go... Well, you're a Christian now. How long have you been a Christian? Well, several years. Well, why do you still act like that? Why do you still live your old life? Why are you still out partying and drinking and all these other things? That's your old life. Don't, I mean, you, you separated yourself from that. You turned from that. He says, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So on your sheet there... The truth in our thinking should be rooted really in our resurrection. It's this idea that that was our old life, we have a new life now. We came out of the water, we were baptized. Not that there's anything specific about baptism, but baptism is a, a physical image of what should have happened on the inside. And that's why we do baptisms, because we are publicly saying, I'm drowning out my own life, and i got a new life now. I'm following after God. The response in our thinking should be seeking God's realm. And a disciple will abandon the wisdom of this world and seek his will, wisdom, and thoughts through the word. Again, we live by every word. If we look to heavenly life, we must adjust our actions. Is it, I mean, what's the biggest hindrance to evangelism? What is, well, it's not the, what is one of the biggest hindrances to evangelism? Fear. Fear? Embarrassment. <laughs> what kind of embarrassment? Uh, it embarrasses somebody's going to make fun of you or somebody's going to reject your True. Okay. Hey, Bob. He stepped out. <laughs> the reason I say that is because how often do we say, well, I don't want to be a part of a church because the church is filled with... Yes. That's one of the biggest hindrances. Is Christians. Welcome. Here we are, right? To join us. Because none of us lives perfectly. But it is right for the unbelieving world to call us out in our hypocrisy at times. Especially if we... I mean, I have a really big mouth, okay? <laughs> so early on, I'm out there evangelizing everybody, and uh, people are going, well, why are you living like this? Hmm, that's a good question, okay? Well, why are you doing this? And who, the best people to call you out is family. Oh, man, they love poking at you when you don't live up to what you're claiming. And are they right? In what sense? It doesn't excuse them. I mean, that, that, God's able to go, well, you had an unbelieving, your brother was a Christian, didn't live up to it, therefore you're, you're, you get a pass? No way. But they are right in saying, hey, you're being hypocritical. And in humility, we go, yeah, you're right, I, I'm working on that. Christians have no room for arrogance. We have 
no room for being condescending or judgmental. We can only go, yeah, you know what, you're right. I, I, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to sanctify and cleanse me, and I'm working on it. But that's different than going, hey, I'm saved, I can go party and confess my sin on Sunday. To sin willfully is different than stumbling. And the, the ultimate goal when God looks at us is, are you trying? Are you living in the power of the Holy Spirit? Are you trying to, to walk worthy of your calling? Because we know the calling that we have is awesome. It's glory. Jesus says, give them the glory that you gave me, Father. I look forward to seeing them. I look forward to John 14. He says, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And I will come back and receive you to myself that where I am, you can be. And we look and we, we consider that as being the rapture. We're excited when Jesus himself gets out of heaven, comes back, takes his church, and goes back to heaven for a little bit of time. Why? So we can see him in his glory. That's what he prays. He goes, don't you know the glory I have for you? Man, you guys are going to rule and reign with me. You're going to sit on my throne. Don't get caught up in this old life stuff. That's not you. That's not what I've called you to. Walk worthy of this awesome destiny that you have. And, he, and that's why he says, if you love me, obey me. And Lord, we love you. We don't, we don't obey you perfectly, but man, when I screw up in humility, I'm going to apologize. And when somebody calls me out, I'm going to say, yeah, you're right. I'm working on that. Are you? Yeah. That's reasonable. <laughs> Are you working on it? You want to join us in working on it? Yes. That's why Paul here, he, he, he switches. He, he says this in verse 5. You will appear with him in glory. Therefore, okay guys, you have this truth. You are going to appear with Jesus in glory. So we go, really? Yes. He says, because of that awesome truth, therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, the physical flesh. Remember, we have a new heart. Where's the new heart live? Unfortunately, it lives in this decaying, rotten, physical body that's slowly decaying, slower and slower and slower until we die. And then we're released from it. And then we're looking forward to what? The time when this body is changed into a new body where there's no sin in it anymore. That's what we want. We want the new nature, the, the, the spiritual part, to dwell in that new physical body that doesn't have any sin in it. And then our temptations are over. But in the meantime, he says, look, put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, sex before marriage, uncleanness, Passion, this is wicked passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is greed, he said, which is idolatry. He says, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. He's got it. What Paul does is here is, hey guys, there's no room for arrogance. Because that used to be you. You walked in that lifestyle. You were part of the world's system. You were part of the world's thinking. But you now claim to follow him. Therefore, put away that old stuff. That's why in Titus 1.16, he says, Paul is, is instructing Titus about the deception that the world offers. He says, these are people who profess to know God. But in their works, in their lifestyle, they deny him. Complete contradictoriness. There are a lot of people who profess to know God. And in their works, they don't live up to what their own profession is. And that's, we all fail in, in some regard to that. That's the humility. But there's also like, well, I'm not intentionally going out and getting wasted this weekend. I'm not intentionally going out and participating in fornication, evil desires, and covetousness, or worshiping idols. That's my old life. But Paul is saying, he says the same thing in Ephesians 5, and we see this consistency. The world says, there was, well, let me say it this way. There was a survey done a couple years ago, and it was talking, and it was asking the world, okay? It was a survey, you know, general sample. It wasn't Christians, it wasn't anything. 
If you were to describe God, how would you describe it? Well, 97% God is forgiving. What? Seems biblical. 96% God is loving. Well, the world's got a pretty good viewpoint of God, doesn't it? What percentage do you think people said that God judges? 20%. It's probably that now. A lot. This was 37. Whoa, whoa, what happened? <laughs> the world obviously, we like a God who is nice and kind and forgiveness because we can go out and sin any way we want. And, and God is loving and there's no truth there. It's like the Santa Claus God. Actually, that's not even true because Santa has, does have a naughty list of Okay? <laughs> But the world doesn't embrace a theology where God actually judges. And they don't run with that, because you can think about that. Think about if you had to go before a judge, what would you want that judge to be? To let everybody off? A bleeding heart? Yeah. Time served, time served, time served. They've been only here for two weeks. They murdered and raped three people. And if that happened to be your family, people like that judge is unworthy and is not committed to justice. See, we scream for justice when it harms us. Or it harms people that we love. But when we come to put ourselves in there, we don't want justice. We want forgiveness and grace. A whopping 19% of the world believes that God punishes sin. And again, when we look at the world... The world doesn't base its thinking off scripture. It's the buffet religion. We, we're going to make God into what we want him to be. And we saw that last week that when we worship God according to our own viewpoints, we saw Leviticus 10, fire comes out and, and annihilates that. God is gracious and compassionate and merciful and forgiving. In Exodus 34, but he says, But by no means will I clear the guilty. And God has come and he's offered us the way of salvation through Jesus Christ alone. Paul goes on in verse 8. But now you yourselves are to put off all of these. So then he says, okay guys, the truth in our actions is rooted in the fact that our old person died. And it, the response in our actions should be evidenced by less sinning. It's not, it's not really complicated. Because we're saying... Man, Lord, you have forgiven me. I used this example yesterday. Was um, I go to my wife and I, I get angry. And in my anger, I punch her in the face. And I go and I say, well, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? And in her graciousness, she says, I forgive you. Well, the next day in my anger, I punch her in the face again. And I go to her and I say, well... Man, I really screwed up again. Will you forgive me? Maybe. Okay, I forgive you. Third day in a row. Pretty soon, in human nature, she's going to say, you know what? What will she say? No. You don't mean it. After the first time you punched me, I encourage you to go get anger management. Have you done that yet? No. Don't sit here and tell me that you're sorry when you aren't doing something about it. And we know that in a human realm, we don't know the heart. God knows the heart. And Paul's point is, hey, when you come to God and you say, Lord, I am such a sinner. I know I've wronged you. I don't deserve to be in heaven. I deserve eternal separation. Out of your kindness. I recognize I need you, and I am sorry. And I'm confessing this. I'm not making any excuses. I need you. I don't deserve it. Will you, in your grace, forgive me and grant me eternal life? And God says, absolutely, I will. And I go, got my get-out-of-jail-free card? It's party time. Seriously? I might profess to know God, but in my works, I deny him. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 7, 23, again, it's a scary, scary, scary verse. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, 
He says, depart from me. I've never known you. You worker of lawlessness or disobedience. Your life has never matched your words. And that's what Paul's after here is that in this new life, he's not, nobody, Philippians 3 says, it, no one has per perfected in this life. But do you have a change when you have committed yourself and I'm going to follow after you, God. I'm going to put my mind on things above, not on things on earth. My mind, I'm going to match it with your scripture. I'm going to think on things above and not on earthly things, he says here. You are to put off all these. Anger. Does anger characterize you? That's part of the old life. That's part of the works of the flesh versus the spirit in Galatians 5. <clears throat> anger should not characterize us. There's no place. The righteousness, it says, it, it, be quick to hear, slow to speak. The wrath of man, the anger of humanity, does not produce the righteousness of God. In James 1.19. As a Christian, man, no, that's our old life. Malice is the same thing. Slander. This one, I have this underlined, because I got this Bible a long time ago when I first got saved. Put this out of your, put these things, put off this. Filthy language out of your mouth. <laughs> Is that unclear? It's interesting that, especially young people, well, that makes them matter. We tend to go, well, you know, a lot of people have a lot of big things. I'm going to keep language. I'm going to keep cussing. I'm going to keep filthy language because, I don't know, I want to have a sense of autonomy. I don't know, who knows? And then we wonder why people question us. Put all filthy language out of your mouth. Well, let's define filthy. I had somebody tell me that. I know that one time. Well, what's filthy, Mondo? Do I really need to tell you? It's to me, your heart's not in the right place. You're looking for what? A way out, a justification. Why don't you err on the side of pure language, okay? And we know in Ephesians 5.4, it's not just this. It's talking about coarse jesting. Talking in ways that are impure. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. A disciple will abandon their old life or the wounded life and make serious efforts of living a life of righteousness by the Spirit. And Paul, what he's after there, is... It's, we all have to look at our life and we go, okay, Lord, what do I think about A, B, C, and D? Am I conforming my thoughts and transforming them to match the scripture? And secondly, are my actions consistent with living according to the new life, including anger and malice and slander and language? I think that I mean, 18 years old, how do you think I spoke? <laughs> With a mouth. And I, I remember at the time going, you know, Lord, man, I'm out here talking. Again, i got a big mouth. And here I am talking about Jesus. The next one is an F-bomb. Now imagine, what would the person say to me? Mondo, that seems a little inconsistent. And what do we say? You're right. I'm sorry. I'm working on it. And I'm asking God to clean up my mouth, to clean up my language. And that seems something so easy. And it's interesting. What I find is this. Um, when we don't give attention to cleaning up the easy things, relatively easy, okay, the hard things aren't going to follow Clean up these little things, but if we leave those alone and we try to fix the bigger things, the challenges, oftentimes God's like, come on, this doesn't match. Let your, Ephesians 4, 29 says, let your, let your, your words, your language be uh, full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that people that hear you, they're going, wow, man, that, there is, that, that. Uh, let me ask you this. 
family members, etc., co-workers. If you live a life of pure language, as an example, do people notice? Oh, they notice. And often they'll go, why don't you talk like us? God has saved me. That's all. I'm not any better than anybody, but I'm trying. Would you stand and pray? Father, as we come this morning, we come here and we are so, so, so thankful. And we sing about it. What you have done for us. And Paul is getting down to the practical matters. He's given us some rich and great theology in the first two chapters of Colossians. And now, he's challenging us to live up to that theology. None of us are perfect, but I pray that you would give us a grand dose of humility. That when we are called out, that we would recognize, yes, I'm working on that. God's grace has forgiven me. Help us to be serious in our walk with you that we truly would put away these, the old life. And it's not that we're earning our salvation, but because of what Jesus has done for us and because we love him, we want to live, we want to make a promise. So I ask Lord that you would continue to fill us with your spirits, that in humility, again, we would be honest with ourselves in those areas. Again, could be anger, could be slander, could be language, could be sexual morality and thoughts, these other things, and you would convict us because you care and you want us to live fully just as you are. And we just pray this all in Jesus' name.
so much for being with us today. And we pray, Lord, that you be with us for the rest of the week and uh, show us your glory more and more. Amen. Amen. Everyone, please have a great day.